Hey, hey guys, it's Dr. Mitch. We're going to get into the drug prevention section here. I got to be candid. The data on these are not particularly impressive. And if you uh, get only the take home message that this is really a challenge, by all means, that's a good lesson. I doubt we're going to even take an hour just because the news is so bad. Bottom line, if you want to prevent people from having drug problems, give them the skills and resources to build a multifaceted, interesting life. And what a surprise, that would help a lot. But this idea that, you know, some cop's going to come to your school five times and suddenly nobody's ever going to want to do drugs is naive and ridiculous. What we'll walk through now are the definitions of just different types of basically school-based and other drug prevention some of the approaches that have been tried, most of which have failed, and we'll talk about at least the theory behind them and why we want to move away from those if they're not working well. Uh, types, just really breaking it down either by uh, the type of people targeted or uh, the approach you want to use to address it, and we'll get into that. And then the outcomes, and unfortunately the outcomes are not particularly good, uh, particularly not for the D.A.R.E. program, which... Some of you probably endured, so let's get into it. So what's the story on prevention? The hope is always an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Anything we can do to literally just reduce uh, the impact, that's going to pay off societally in the long run. If you can delay initial use, it's astounding how my data and data from other labs say you know, if you've never tried cigarettes until markedly later in life, you're much less likely to develop drug problems later on. Uh, and same for cannabis. And then they're saying eliminate the probability of developing alcohol, tobacco, and drug use disorders. I'm fine with that. Unfortunately, what often happens is they ask, have you ever used? And then if somebody has used one time, they act like that's some kind of disaster. When in fact, we know from the data that that's pretty much the norm. All right, so since most ATOD, so alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, begins before age 20, schools are the primary institution with access to this age group. Right? Because we make you go to prison, and because we make you go to school, this is our chance to grab you and try to indoctrinate you in uh, all kinds of different ways, including that you should never do drugs ever. The most common provision strategy has been education, which is compatible with the school's goals. Well, Knowing a lot about drugs and even knowing how they work and their history and things like that doesn't help. <laughs> we have lots of data on that. As I told you guys the first day, uh, this class also doesn't prevent drug problems. It's good to know the biological effects, understand that the chronic effects are negative, but that alone is not enough to keep large groups of people away from drugs of abuse. So what do we see? If this is going to be our approach, these school-based ones, most of them are aimed at adolescents or children, so 10 to 16. All right, I'm going to make the case that this is probably way too late, but we want to keep it developmentally appropriate. Let's see what we're doing. Because the majority of the youth experiment with substances, prevention needs to target all students. Uh, maybe. Right, But since everybody at school is taking school together and you don't often get individualized tracks on things, we might as well find something that could be helpful for a large group of folks. And that's what we're going to call primary interventions, and we'll get into it. Since risk factors are present years before use begins, prevention activities need to start in elementary school. Okay, I like that a lot. And be periodically reinforced as students grow and encounter new social situations and pressures. All right. What we're actually finding out is if we teach people how to make good decisions, how to build a multifaceted life, help them improve relaxation skills, learn how to manage their time, things like that. What a surprise. Those are splendid buffers. But instead of saying, oh, and never do drugs and spending hours and hours on that, why don't we train folks in alternative behaviors, often drug incompatible behaviors, and have that go? So programs designed to meet developmental needs of students should be offered at each grade level without oversaturating students. Right? And this is the problem, really. Right? 
if you've got a health class that has a, uh, a section on this, that's great. But what would be a better use of your time? Getting folks excited about some kind of academic thing. If you're involved in uh, athletics, if you're connected to some extracurricular, often, and I'm not saying always, often that is a good buffer against drug use. Good. Except you drama people. We'll get into that later. So what are the preventative interventions? And I feel like this is already getting slippery, you see. Let's just call these preventions. Right? But the primary intervention is going to focus on literally folks who have never used drugs. And truth be told, anybody else who happens to be in there, but pitched to an age and a group that is really, really broad, right? And the hope was let's minimize initial use. So obviously, if you never initiate, you're never going to develop a drug problem. Okay. I mean, it's kind of a, an ambitious goal, given what we know about the norms. But at least if we start early on, we could definitely say, wow, there is no good time to start using some drugs. Let's spread the word about these. Make it fact-based, train folks in alternative ways to manage their emotions, deal with interpersonal conflict, things like that. That's going to have a, a nice ring to it. Secondary interventions. So these primarily focus on folks who've already experimented, right? Probably had their first puff from a cigarette or their first sip of beer or something like that. Do we want to handle these folks a little differently? And the data suggests we don't know exactly how, but definitely not the way we've been doing it. Right? And then tertiary is just, these are folks who have already had drug problems. Either uh, they got arrested, which is always a fucking dreadful outcome, or they've shown you know symptoms of problematic use, DWI, uh, some kind of liver screen, you know, anything like that that suggests that, wow, their, their drug use is clearly maladaptive. We want separate interventions for those folks, because you can imagine the primary interventions may not be news to them, so to speak. Now, these other three categories, you saw this, uh, Dr. Hart did these, so universal, selective, and indicated kind of map onto this in the same way. So universal means we're just going to sp spread something out to everybody, selective, we're going to target a specific crew, and that one is selective, but not always secondary, like we might want to make a selective one that's just for... Uh, athletes, that's just for women, that's just for Native Americans, right? And we might want to pitch it differently, although the way I've seen those done is often terrible. You could imagine that the unique needs of uh, oh, LGBT crew, right, might, it might be fun to have uh, a program that's really focused on that, and the, and the people can at least enjoy getting together with their own people and make the experience better. And then indicated usually means, okay, they're already uh, tertiary, basically, they're already having some problems. So if you know these terms, that'll be a few questions on the test. So what's the story on this? Ideally, based on scientific knowledge about the prevalence of drug use in the target population, the age of first use, the determinants of use, the patterns of use, mental health problems, and a theoretical view of the intervention. All right? So we're demanding a lot here. But I want to stick to this first part in particular, based on scientific knowledge, right? Not hearsay, not here's what we thought it was, not here's what my rabbi told me, but what are the empirical data suggesting would help with this, right? And as we've been going through, we've noticed some drugs really are different from others. Some drugs really are hard to use without developing problems. Some drugs really are not for human consumption, independent of whether they're legal or not. Okay? And then target populations. We've seen ethnic, gender, uh, and all kinds of other individual differences on this. The hope is, though, is this age of first use, if we could push that back, and then the determinants of drug use, so what a surprise, certain personality traits, although there's no addictive personality, tend to co-vary, maybe we could target that and make a special prevention program just for sensation-seeking people, right? Just for some group that shares something in common. And then the patterns of drug use, it really is so ideographic. So there are areas where 
it's really all about which drugs are available. It's all about uh, parental use and things like that. Mental health problems. Uh, who's at risk? Well, we talked about it already for the treatment stuff, but mood disorders, anxiety disorders, antisocial personality disorder. Right? Let's see if we can buttress uh, those folks so that their symptoms don't end up making them more likely to use drugs in a problematic way. And a theoretical view of the intervention. All right? I've got a theory. People use drugs when they feel bad. Okay? Really complicated negative reinforcement model, right? But if that's my theory, what do I need to do? Get folks to decatastrophize feeling bad, right? Hey, maybe being sad isn't a complete disaster. It's not so terrible that I have to do a drug the second I feel it, right? And then my theory leads to my intervention. Train folks in decatastrophizing negative affect or learn some skills for emotion regulation, right? All that from one really straightforward, almost banal theory, but at least that one's consistent. It's when we start throwing in everything but the kitchen sink. Oh, I heard this helps, and let's let them do this, and have them dance, and have them sing. Like, make them write essays. So it's not part of my theory. I don't need to get into that. And now I really not only understand does mind work or not, but... If it's working in a way that sounds like it's supporting my theory, I might extend the theory and I might be able to come up with new interventions that are consistent with it. And that's what we really want to do. That's a good use of our time and money, as opposed to the, let's just throw everything at the little buggers and see what happens. So I am going to zoo. Do people still say zoo? I'm going to complain about D.A.R.E. for quite some time here. Uh, I don't want you to finish, like, totally bummed out, like if your little sims or nieces and nephews or something are uh, enduring D.A.R.E. I don't want you to have to freak out. And so this website will show you all these alternatives to D.A.R.E. that really do work. Uh, my friend Steve Sussman has one on here. Uh, several other approaches, some pretty disparate things, too, things that I never thought would have worked. And we'll get into it, but I want you to understand this is what's going to come up, so don't get completely bummed out uh, before I get to do the third act here and, and try to turn things around. But my promise to you, my, my uh, real approach is always, can we connect folks to a buffer? And what do I mean by that? Is there something about the academics in school? Is there something about being connected to a sport? Is there something about your religious affiliation? Is there one friend you have who doesn't use drugs, right? Any of these, and having just one of them doesn't mean you'll never smoke pot. It just means you're less likely to, as a youngster, develop a drug problem, right? And I feel like that should be our outcome measure. This getting frantic because two extra kids smoked a cigarette is a waste of time. But who's running into trouble early in life? That's what we want to prevent. In part because the intoxication experience impairs learning. And then if you don't get to develop these skills early on, it sends you on a bad trajectory down the line, right? If you don't finish high school, you're more likely to end up in jail you're more likely to not earn a lot of money. You're more likely to be distressed. Right? If we could just get you through high school, oh my God, it's so great, right? Then, yes, people with a college degree definitely do better than people who only have a high school degree in the long run on the average. And I know you all know exceptions and hooray for those people, right? Now, going to grad school is maladaptive and ridiculous. And if you're considering it, please be sure to email me, but it's not going to help you earn more money, uh, particularly given how long it's going to take. Right? And I hate to say it, folks who go to college are more likely to smoke pot than folks who don't. So even going to college puts you at risk. you got to be careful. But my take-home message is there are plenty of programs that do work even though D.A.R.E. doesn't. And what makes this good? Well, in fact, I would say if it increases knowledge about drugs, that's nice, but that's not enough, right? We all know those guys who could literally 
talk about all kinds of minutia about the neurotransmitters, but they're also really problematic drug users, so that alone's not going to work. Reducing the risk of drugs. Ding, 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 ding. Now, of course, I like this, but obviously it's a hard reduction thing, and it doesn't mean never using. So before they nail me to a cross on the cover of People magazine, let me just say one way to reduce the risk of drugs is to never do them. But as we talked about in the treatment, we could also decrease the quantity, decrease frequency, decrease problematic ways of administration, right? Anything we can do to buffer against negative consequences, that's, to me, a step in the right direction. And if the prevention program makes that happen, hooray. Now, delaying the onset of first use. I'm a big fan of this. And, you know, don't do as I did do as I say. The longer you wait, the better it goes, okay? Not just the we can make, but like literally, if you don't ever use any drugs until you're 24 years old and your frontal lobe is all developed, things are going to go way better than if you start hitting it hard early in life. Reducing abuse of drugs, although we don't have that formal abuse definition like we used to, you know what I mean, right? Maladaptive use in a way that gets you in a lot of trouble even if you aren't necessarily dependent. So you might not have tolerance, you might not have withdrawal, but you get drunk once a week and have ill-advised sexual encounters and, you know, drive in unsafe ways and wake up on the front of your car with the keys in your ass, right? Like, you just don't want to have bad things happen, even if they aren't necessarily part of a substance use problems diagnosis. And then minimizing the harm caused by the use of drugs. Well, I feel like that's what reducing the risk is. Um, I'm thinking the prevention guys want to reduce the risk of ever using versus minimizing the harm if you do. And what makes this good? Well, in fact, I would say if it increases knowledge about drugs, that's nice, but that's not enough. Right? We all know those guys who could literally talk about all kinds of minutia about the neurotransmitters, but they're also really problematic drug users, so that alone's not going to work. Reducing the risk of drugs. Ding, 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 ding. Now, of course, I like this, but obviously it's a hard reduction thing, and it doesn't mean never using. So before they nail me to a cross on the cover of People magazine, let me just say one way to reduce the risk of drugs is to never do them. But as we talked about in the treatment, we could also decrease the quantity, decrease frequency, decrease problematic ways of administration, right? Anything we can do to buffer against negative consequences, that's, to me, a step in the right direction. And if the prevention program makes that happen, hooray. Now, delaying the onset of first use. I'm a big fan of this. And, you know, don't do as I did do as I say. The longer you wait, the better it goes, okay? Not just the we can make, but like literally, if you don't ever use any drugs until you're 24 years old and your frontal lobe is all developed, things are going to go way better than if you start hitting it hard early in life. Reducing abuse of drugs, although we don't have that formal abuse definition like we used to, you know what I mean, right? Maladaptive use in a way that gets you in a lot of trouble even if you aren't necessarily dependent. So you might not have tolerance, you might not have withdrawal, but you get drunk once a week and have ill-advised sexual encounters and you know drive in unsafe ways and wake up on the front of your car with the keys in your ass, right? Like you just don't want to have bad things happen, even if they aren't necessarily part of a substance use problems diagnosis. And then minimizing the harm caused by the use of drugs. Well, I feel like that's what reducing the risk is. Um, I'm thinking the prevention guys want to reduce the risk of ever using versus minimizing the harm if you do. Well, so what do the good programs have in common? And the fact that I can even say good ones is a nice sign. Right? Dare does not work, we know, but there are some that really do. Now, as you might guess, they're time-consuming, they're expensive, somebody's really got to donate a lot of effort and money and time to make them happy, make them happen, and they aren't as popular as D.A.R.E., so 
this is my dilemma. So anytime, you know, you get a chance to talk their down and talk empirically supported treatment prevention efforts up, please do. So these are the key elements of the effective programs. First and foremost, empirically supported. Right? What a surprise. That's how I know they're effective. It's not because my cousin's Johnny friend, nephew's major uncle said it works. It's we've got data showing it has worked multiple times in settings like the one I want to use it in. Accurate and developmentally appropriate info about drugs. Woo, man, can I jump up and down about this, right? Well, first of all, accurate. Think of all the lies you've probably heard about cannabis as a kid. And then as soon as you hear it, you lose credibility. You think these guys don't know what they're talking about, right? So then, you know, if I went in and said, oh, marijuana is a gateway drug. And then I say, oh, meth makes your brain rot. Why would you listen to me? I just said, um ridiculous marijuana is a gateway drug thing, right? So you lose your credibility and you lose the entire conversation unless you have accurate info and then developmentally appropriate, right? Obviously, the intervention we want in fifth grade is going to be different from the one junior year of high school, but the fact that I even have to say that tells you how badly these can be fashioned sometimes, right? Interactive delivery methods, obviously, if you could go back and forth, right? If the leader is a group leader with a little bit of dynamic oomph, who's willing to listen and take questions and have you interact, what a surprise. Not only is the outcome better, well, not only is it a good time at the time, but the outcomes end up being better, right? So you're not bored, you're not falling asleep. And you get to ask the things that matter to you. All right. Social influence model. Well, what we're finding out, what a surprise, is people who use a lot of drugs tend to think everybody else is using a lot of drugs. And it's often true in their little circle, right? So we have some normative control about this. So the normative education. Right? If you're smoking cannabis once a week, just once a week, 98% of the U.S. smokes cannabis less than you, less often. And I'm sure that's startling, right? Waking up to the idea that most folks not only don't have drug problems, they don't even use drugs. 30% of the U.S. doesn't even drink alcohol, right? Getting that point across, right now, with some drugs, obviously cannabis, everybody's like, yeah, those guys are losers. And we're number one. You know, stuff like that. So I have to be careful with it. But the social influence notion of let's make sure you are connected to a community where use may be fine, but problematic use is something that you don't want to have. Right? So the normative education is literally making people aware of the norms. Social skills training, it's funny how Interpersonal conflicts are often splendid predictors of not only drug use, but relapse after you've had a good run of maintenance. And if folks know how to handle their negative emotions, how to make assertive requests, how to decline unreasonable requests from friends, that's going to help a lot. And then the teacher training is important. Let's be honest. If these fucking paid better, they'd be better, right? If somebody could make 150 bucks an hour going school to school, making these presentations in an interactive, delightful, entertaining way, I mean, it'd be astounding, right? But no, instead we, you know, ugh, you know, don't get me started. All right, enough of my ranting. We're going to take a break right here and then pick it up for prevention too. So thanks for being along for the ride. Get yourself a little five minute break. Dance around if you need to. Listen to some music. Write yourself a couple of questions and we'll be good to go.